Hello and welcome to Long COVID Foundation podcast. At the Long COVID Foundation, our vision is to improve health and well-being of long COVID sufferers by contributing to long COVID diseases understanding and treatment options. And to do this, we work with organizations and individuals of medical profession, scientists, researchers, and long COVID interest groups to promote awareness of long-standing symptoms, health, and rehabilitation challenges. And today we decided to organize a second roundtable discussion. The first one we held on NeuroCOVID some time ago, so you can find it in our channel. And today's more general discussion on how we have progressed since our previous meeting in terms of diseases understanding and treatment options. And it is always my pleasure to welcome top scientist Joachim Gerlach, who is leading researcher at the Long COVID Coalition and co-founder of Medicinals, and Dr. Abdulmanan Baik, who is medical and scientific advisor at the Long COVID Foundation and associate professor at the Aga Khan University, Pakistan. So gentlemen, Welcome to our roundtable discussion today. Hello and good evening from Pakistan. Uh, I don't know what's the time at your place. Today we'll have a very detailed roundtable discussion that what the current situation is. We will tell you different organ systems being involved. It's always a pleasure joining the group. Thank you. Thank you. Joachim? Yes, hello. Good evening, good afternoon. And uh, yeah, thank you for the invitation, Valentina. And uh, yeah, I'm glad to give you um, and uh, Dr. Mann my, my insights. We are, as you know, constantly 24 seven research, researching and evaluating materials. Before we start uh, going into discussion, I just wanted to read a very short disclaimer that everything what we'll hear tonight is not medical advice. And this presentation is for informational and educational purposes only. So for any medical advice, please speak to your medical practitioners. So Joachim, I would like to hear your view on how the virus has evolved and in particular, what new variants bring us. So we hear that Omicron is mild, but at the same time, we read that it messes up our immune system. On the one hand, we hear that we no longer need to follow safety measures. On the other hand, we read that and see that more people die among our communities just from sudden. So your research finding always bring fire to scientific groups we work with. So I would be really grateful if you could share these bombshell findings with our communities too. Yes, uh, thank you for that. We were thinking about how to coin this, this little uh, session today. And actually, um, I'm torn between calling it wake up call and uh, maybe only just a simple scientific description of what's going on. But the term wake up call is there for a reason. It's not to be alarmist or to create some fear or whatever. It is more like to put things into perspective where we think should be the middle ground of uh, not being overly scared, but also not being overly careless. So yeah, let's go dive right into the presentation, please. And let's have a look at uh, what is uh, unfolding at the moment. Today's presentation um, will give us an idea of, at least from some angles, where we are standing. Uh, this metaphor picture is a uh, uh, just showing a little bit uh, how we think we still are. We are still like, like a prisoner of this virus and uh, it will take quite a lot of effort to get out of these. The first question that we have to ask ourselves is what is happening? Uh, the last two years in the summertime in Europe, these are the German numbers, we had almost no cases. The, the seven day moving average was around 600. And in the summer of 2022, at the same time in July, we are facing numbers of 95,000 moving average. That is 150 times uh, the level we saw last summer. How is that possible now if the COVID cases are on this unprecedented rise? So what is really happening and what are the factors that can lead to this and what has been overlooked by the medical community and the authorities? The first fact, of course, is that Omicron is much more infectious than previous strains. The r naught is above 18, which is similar to measles. That means it is very, very infectious. Okay, that can be one reason. But then why do we see these frequent re, uh, reinfections and breakthrough infections? Now that, uh, of course, suggests that even having been infected with Omicron, it doesn't really protect you from getting reinfected. So there must be something wrong. 
with our immune system. Then there's another thing to be observed, which I want to bring to the attention at this point, is that this virus is behaving like a bacteriophage. That means it is infecting our oral and gut bacteria. That is not widely known, and that's why I'm emphasizing it at this point again, because the treating medics and the medical community have to be aware of that. If we go to the next slide, we can see a microscopic picture done by Dr. Carlo Bronia and his team uh, who discovered this fact. And it shows that this virus can enter, invade and breed in bacteria. There are several mechanisms that play out at this point. The bacteria is multiplying, even containing the virus. And uh, this will have, of course, implications on how to treat the disease, especially at onset and what kind of measures you want to take to protect people from um, spreading the bacteria even, because the bacteria can now contain, or now we know that it cont contains virus. Here we see another feature that is not well known, and that is the so-called sensitivity formation, where the um, virus is calling the cell membranes of cells to fuse together and form clusters of cells. So either the virus, by infecting some of these cells, is able to create this uh, membrane fusion, or the spike protein alone, even in some other immune cells, has been now proven to do that. So this is, of course, another factor that most people are not aware of, because everybody thinks this virus goes into a cell, replicates, and pops out, and goes to the next cell. No, it is creating conglomerates of cells that are then becoming zombie cells. So this is a very quick process and can affect a, a large amount of cells. It seems like this virus has learned a lot of things, has become much smarter, much more dangerous in many ways. Maybe it doesn't cause the respiratory symptoms that we have seen in the Alpha and Delta variant, but it is for sure now being proven to be antibody evasive, especially with the Omicron subvariants, especially the new ones, BA4, BA5. So the question is, uh, what can we do about that to stop that virus from spreading and look at now in the next steps what the virus can do to our organism. You can see that it does not only in infect bacteria and cause a lot of havoc in our general uh, organ uh, cells. It can also go directly and infect our T lymphocytes in an ACE2 independent manner, which we will discuss a little bit later. How does it get in there? But these uh, images and the measurements and, uh, show very clearly that you have a direct infection and destruction of many cells in the immune system, not only the T lymphocytes, but also inf it infects directly monocytes, macrophages, CD4 cells, T helper, helper cells, and many other um, cells are being affected by COVID conditions or SARS-CoV-2 infection, um, even showing reduction of natural killer cells, decrease of basal cells, and other immunoparalysis actually happening. Plus, it can ev avoid uh, rec uh, recognition through CD8 cells and is becoming resistant to interferons, which are all kind of very worrisome developments. These are uh, documented uh, reinfections that can be, of course, be attributed not only to the infectivity of that virus, but also to, to the immunoparalysis and immunodeficiency and antibody evasiveness of that virus. So we would include these factors into um, the evaluation of the current situation. If you look at long haulers that are um, being reinfected, they are, of course, in the clear and present danger of, of having a severe relapse in their long COVID conditions. So they need to be extra cautious. Now, and we have a lot of reports from our uh, patients and clients that are uh, reporting that they are, are getting reinfected now uh, in the Omicron var various times, up to four times. And another um, fact that we see on the next slide is not only the reinfection with Omicron or coronavirus, if we look at that, these are the numbers of the German Robert Koch Institute, which is monitoring all infectious diseases. And if you look at the red line, these are normal non-COVID respiratory infections, and they are being as high as they are usually in the winter, skyrocketing in July, which is very, very unusual. Apart from the frequent reinfections and breakthrough infections, we can observe that there seems to be some uh, sort of um, lack of immune strength in the pop general population to fend off normal re respiratory infections. 
then of course the uptake of herpes one and two, shingles, Epstein-Barr, other bacterial and fungal infections that are observed and especially in former COVID patients. The question is um, if we get reinfected with uh, Omicron and it's even a mild virus, so to speak, but it does impair our immune system, then this is of course not a, a thing we can just brush off and leaves of course the question about herd immunity. Can we train our immune system with a virus that is actually infiltrating, infecting and destroying our immune system at the same time? So that question needs to be settled. So then we come to the next topic, uh, which our group is working on, and there's currently a publication underway uh, because we found that another interesting finding. The work of uh, Dr. Pretorius from South Africa laid the basic foundation of understanding that in COVID and long COVID, the kind of micro uh, the thrombi and the clotting is different than in normal throm thrombolytic events. The next step that was uh, to be taken into account was the work of Dr. P uh, Hammerstrom from Sweden, where he showed that if the S protein and, uh, and, and serum and amyloid come together, and if you add neutrophil and estase, then these fibers that are forming are becoming uh, very difficult to disaggregate and they seem to form, how can you say, base material for all these microthrombi. And so this is an important finding. And if you look at the numbers of, uh, of strokes, deep brain thrombosis and uh, heart attacks at the moment and the reports from the hospitals, then this seems to be a big factor in what is going on at the present moment. Here we have some pictures of deceased patients these clots have been described described as rubber-like, so that they are really like a, have a completely different um, composition than clots that we have seen before COVID, and so that needs to be taken into account. And we are working on solutions, documenting how is it what is possible to do about these clottings. And in the worst case scenario, they look like what you see on these pictures. There we see also other damages that can be caused by these microthrombi or um, what is happening in, let's say, in the cardiovascular system going through the brain. And uh, so uh, apart from the neurological direct structural damages, which we will shine a light on in the next slides, you can see that even the thrombotic events in the brain uh, can cause severe damage. So here we come to the point of what kind of structural damage to the brain and central nervous can be caused mid to long term by the SARS-CoV-2 or COVID conditions. And I'm not speaking now about brain fog and normal, let's say, um, disbalances in the neuro neurotransmitters and, and these kind of problems, which are not really representing any structural damage. But SARS-CoV-2 can cause severe brain damage, and it's starting to play out. We see in all the studies, in all the documentation, that there is an upregulation of all biomarkers that lead or that indicate that there is an ongoing um, neurological damage, like alpha synuclein, TDP43, tau protein, proteins, amyloid beta, and so on. Maybe uh, Dr. Manon can later sh shine a better light on that. If you looked at the next slides, that is for us at the moment, the one that we have to watch most, we did get reports, is ALS and the, the, the pathology progression, pro progression in that and how it is connected to the olfactory pathway and maybe to the symptom of loss of smell and taste, or at least smell. Then we go to, a next, to the next topic, which is uh, being uh, in the focus right now, myocarditis, pericarditis, and cardiac arrest. Um, there were a lot of reports of young athletes collapsing because of these conditions. Valentina brought to our attention that there has been now a different pathway identified, the catecholamine pathway, that can cause these kind of conditions, especially in healthy young male adults. So this must be watched and should be measured, especially in the groups that uh, now uh, are in this category. We just want to bring that to the general attention in the medical and scientific community so that the understanding of why these cardiac arrests are happening is deepened. There we want to also initiate a discussion today between uh, the fact of the impairment of the T lymphocytes, which we have seen before, where SARS-CoV-2 is infecting the T lymph lymphocytes directly. And uh, we, we do get uh, numbers of long haulers. And uh, 
other groups of patients where the T lymphocytes and the natural killer cells are very low, the, even the count of the, uh, almost to the level of uh, patients that have AIDS. And it stays in some of them even for two years at a very low level. So it doesn't seem to recover this system. And uh, if you look at the function of T lymphocytes, of course, they also are keeping can cancer cells at bay. And so this, this function is, uh, in, in addition to fighting off virus, viruses and pathogens, is being impaired. So this needs to be taken into account. It's already being reported in uh, long COVID patients that uh, there is an uptick of uh, cancer development. It's been reported from other medical uh, uh, circles as well that there's a strong uptick in cancer. And I, we think that it is practically a, a two-component system leading to that. On one hand, you have your immune system damaged and impaired and not able to control uh, cancer cells. And on the other hand, it seems like that or it's been shown that this virus has some um, cancer-causing properties. If we look at the next slide, this is from a Swedish scientist that's an expert on microscopy analysis of cancer cells. And um, she's reporting that the cancers that she's seen lately in the last eight months or 10 months are becoming much more aggressive and they are growing much faster. So we thought, okay, let's have a look at, in general, at the statistics. And on the next slide, you can see that uh, we just uh, looked up the uh, ca cancer cases in the US and between 2017 and 2020, uh, there was an average of 1.74 million cancer cases each year reported in the US. In the year 2021, this is now being reported at 1.9 million. Even with all the problems of the lockdowns and the uh, people being reluctant to do cancer checks, uh, we are not talking about cancer death, we are talking about reported cancer cases. And so the average of 2019 and 2020 that was remaining pretty much at the same level as the previous years. And in 2021, we could see a strong uptick. So let's keep an eye on these numbers, because if that's the case, it needs to be addressed somehow and needs to be prevented. The industry is already um, preparing for certain cancers that they will rise, as you can see in this statistics here, that's without any comment from my side, that there seems to be a, a very direct correlation between ACE2 and TMPRSS2 in the characteristics of uh, the COVID-19 collateral cancer patients. So reports all over the place should be kept an eye on and should be addressed. And we have to see what could be the responses. We will discuss that in the next round. Thank you very much, Joachim. That was very informative scientific information as always. And I really appreciate your time and effort that you bring this uh, to, to the community to understand where we really are. Because uh, we're getting so many destructive reports on the media that are somehow not aligned with the signs that we see in many journals that we read every day. I'll, I'll just maybe we'll try to summarize the main problems that you have highlighted in a more understandable language for people. Uh, and uh, please correct me if I will be wrong. <laughs> we see reinfections happening uh, among communities. So we know that COVID cases didn't disappear and growing on a daily basis. Exactly the same situation is observed in, in UK. We see the numbers of COVID cases growing. It's not just from the statistics, but we also hear that from people who suffer with long COVID. Quite strange why people get reinfected so quickly after their previous infection. It takes a couple of months for people and they get reinfection. And uh, every second infection, uh, the symptoms, as you said, are getting worse. So the conditions becoming heavier and uh, they get new symptoms or they develop more uh, severe cases of previous symptoms that they had. So the illness itself progresses with the secondary infection. Even though infection can be mild for the acute phase, they do develop severity afterwards. 
So, and most probably this is because of the issues that you have highlighted just now. Question would be, if Omicron is mild in terms of symptoms that people experience, maybe then the problem with Omicron is that it goes straight to the brain and uh, shows the symptoms, severity of Omicron after some time. So when their illness develops further in the brain. So Manan, question to you, how potentially Omicron could be damaging to people, not necessarily being mild, but damaging as, as we know that ALS cases are becoming now uh, more obvious and uh, Joachim just highlighted uh, the severity of these cases. What I want to say here is that the first uh, answer to your question that uh, whether the diseases uh, with Omicron should uh, ever be called as mild because uh, uh, it's not me alone. Even if Omicron could speak, okay, it would disagree with us that uh, who, who the hell are you to call me mild? Just try to understand your immune system and your life is just like a glass of water, okay? Each time you get an infection, it gets filled a little. And then it, you get reinfected, it gets filled a little more. Okay, so uh, tell me, okay, what's the capacity of your glass? I mean, it needs only six to eight spill, you know, from the jug. Once it's filled, when I say filled, it's actually you are having no more lymphocytes to fight because each time it attacks you, reinfects you, it produces a qualitative and a quantitative reduction in the function of the lymphocytes, done. So when you say mild, okay, let's put it that, this way that you take water from the jug, okay, and spill only like four tablespoons. What about it, okay? Nothing mild here because the next four tablespoons, if they even become three, there will be a point, okay, when the glass will get filled. That's it. The severe lymphocytopenia and then person cannot fight anything. Joachim presented uh, God knows how many slides, okay, when I, I could, couldn't even count them, you know. But then it was giving me a basic lesson. You will see a rise in every other viral infection that the T lymphocyte normally protects us from. You will see a fungus on rise, okay, that you are already observing. It happened in India, if you remember. Everybody was attributing it to the mask and its dirtiness and its unhealthiness. Forget about it. You wear it, okay, the farmers wear it in the, in, the, in the farming areas for the whole day without COVID, okay, they don't get uh, eucormycosis or fungal infection. So then the tuberculosis and then the cancer. So when I was taught basic immunology in my medical school, you know, what they said, if you have got lymphocytopenia, you will have fungal infection repeatedly. You will have a rise in the reinfections of, uh, or reactivation of the viruses. You will get a tuberculosis which would not respond to drugs and you will be subjected to cancers, okay, which normally are kept under the check by those lymphocytes. So this is my uh, way of explaining the mild. Each time you say mild, you fill that glass a little more. So all those guys, okay, who think the masks are useless, that we are now defenseless, we will one day, one beautiful day, okay, you, we will get a herd immunity. That beautiful day is not coming, okay, at least Omicron and Delta and the present B variants, okay, all of them in line are proving those population uh, uh, subsets wrong. That one day we will uh, achieve herd immunity. Now comes uh, I come to the second question that that what is the neurological because my area of interest, okay. So see, you can only uh, talk about a neurological symptom when the, there is a neuronal, axonal, or, or injury going on in the brain and the spinal cord. And then if you just check uh, so me, uh, social media outlets, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, they are flooded with the patients okay, who are having normal CT scan, normal MRI, but with symptoms. So we shared a publication with you guys okay, in my last talk okay, in which uh, I shared my, one of my paper okay, in which I said that if you are having microscopic injury okay, at molecular level, it won't show up on MRI or CT scan. So who knows, the damage is going on. In 10, 15 years, all of these long haulers and long COVID patients would exhibit that feature ultimately on uh, CT scans and MRI. What are we doing to prevent or slowing it down? Uh, are we even thinking? So we took ages to recognize even long COVID as a long COVID. Now, 
NIH, CDC, WHO, everybody is singing the same song, long COVID. You call it post-acute phase, what you call as COVID seculi. Very great, okay? Even tongue doesn't feel good by like prolonging the sentence to such a big nomenclature. Okay, so the point is, call it whatever. But if it is, it's affecting the brain, how do I know? Okay, just tell me, okay, which, uh, which other lesion, okay, could cause nerve palsies, muscle fasciculation, blindness, you know, loss of speech, having you know, difficulty in breathing, the sense of dysautonomia, okay, thoughts, you name it. I mean, like, uh, COVID-19 has made us very good in symptom listing, okay, nothing less than 15 or 16 when one organ gets involved. The brain, okay, above 26 symptoms and signs. I mean, look at this. And, and we always correlate it with, you know, if I get severely ill, okay, I get hospitalized for 15 days, okay, then I, I've got a chance that possibly my brain is involved. No, wrong. It only takes a mild viral dose in the nose and the lung. And if it's the nose, okay, now, now I was sharing a paper with Joachim and his group, okay, that milder infection in the nose, okay, could very easily ascend to the brain cause a disease. Now, how would we know, okay, acutely, one can have stroke, one, like Joachim shared one slide, okay, in which you saw in part in the brain. That guy you know, just gets admitted like this in the hospital and gets the complication and the lesion like that. What about those guys, okay, who are developing slow, low-grade, small ring type of a brain lesion to very quickly progress to Alzheimer's-like like stage, okay, within 40 years of his life, okay, being 25 or 30 now. Just imagine what damage it is causing. The beta amyloid, like, accumulating there, Many papers have been published now showing a very short-term development of those uh, amyloid beta, which you see normally in a 75 to 80-year-old guy. Why 40 years old people are developing it? Only because we don't know the mechanism. Omicron or Delta doesn't bother us that whether we know the mechanism or not, okay? The sooner we do, the better it is. But like it is causing the damage, it's going on. And then God forbid, okay, when, when, whenever we'll get biopsies from the brain of, of a few patients of long COVID, you will see the deposits will be there and, and that could, could not be seen on, on CAT scan or MRI. And then again, we will be coming with a, with a very a great term of sorry. We didn't understand the disease. Who is going to understand the disease? Omicron won't understand the disease. We have to understand it because we are the host and delays are there. So I don't blame it on uh, the patients because they keep on crying that I've got these symptoms. Their GPs and their local doctors, okay, don't have a clue because they say we, we talk about anything which is written in the book. The books are to be written on, 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 on COVID, okay, and we have got six to eight years to do that. But are we, are we uh, just keep on going to say to the patient that I don't know the disease, okay, you go and suffer? No, it's not like that. We have to be proactive and we have to be ahead of the curve with this virus because when it comes to failing a human-like species, Okay, you, you should not doubt the ability of any variant of this virus, be it Omicron, B, B lineage, or, or, or any other emerging one. Like the Joshim and, and you said in the beginning, uh, the purpose of this roundtable discussion is not alarming anybody. But you tell me, okay, if we don't alert you, if we don't herald you, if we don't say it candidly, okay, if we say it in seven years, okay, so what's the difference between us and those, those, those uh, uh, authorities who are denying it? will be blamed equally. At, so at least I want few voices to be heard when we are pro proactively showing you, telling you, forecasting its damage, which gets proven in a year or two, then it's, uh, you have lost the time. So uh, with, with some regrets, okay, I have to say that governments have to be proactive. They, ha they haven't been proactive. And if you are not active with this virus, okay, just give him the driving seat. It's going to give you so, such bumps, okay, that that would uh, remain, get you paralytic okay, at, at any stage of your life. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Man. I, I have some more questions here. Let us also dive a little bit more into the science. I received a paper uh, two days ago from our friend, Dr. Senef, and that was describing uh, the prion-like domain and the prion-like uh, developments being now reported even in, in, in COVID and long COVID. And there were some interesting factors there that this PRPSC, the, the prion-like uh, infectious, infectious misfolded protein, was not able to really do that by itself, that it needed some catalyst. 
and then uh, we bounce that back and forth today on uh, maybe there is some other uh, catalyst involved of, of making that kind of able now to be become a a prime that can multiply itself the question is uh, um, we are we are going to write a paper up together that will address this um these all these mechanisms and uh, we i don't i think we have more, more than 1500 different publications that we take as reference into this whole um, amount of research and that we will then try to bring in some novelty in there by correlating it and connecting the dots what is really going on on all these levels yeah. but to alert the medical community it seems that that the race is being won by als at this moment at least that is what the first indicators show and we were we were actually betting more on parkinson but it is now als that is seems to be the first over the finishing line in such a short time in less than two and a half years to manifest already as a severe neurological condition uh, in COVID conditions. So the answer to that is uh, like uh, with the help and uh, the collaborations that we have got, the different groups are working on different aspects of this disease, especially when it comes to neurological deficits or damages, some of them on thrombosis. Uh, again, I don't want to sound like a person who is over alarming the community. But uh, let me be very candid to say this, that we do not actually understand the complete nature or the molecular nature of that S protein of this virus. Why? Because 2020, 2021, we just thought that it has got a portion known as a receptor binding domain. That receptor binding domain sits on AS2 receptor, the host cell engulfs it. So 1.5 years, okay, only AS2 receptor significance of the S S protein, okay, done. So in the last six months, okay, what, what we knew, uh, uh, something novel and new about this S protein is that it has got some sequences, okay, which cannot be digested by normal enzymes in our body, you know. So when we break it into small segments, okay, and our cells don't know what to do with it, you know what, do, they misfold it, okay. And, and then it comes into a new shape, a new form of a protein, which if you don't get rid of, start getting deposited. Now, they might be very unique forms of beta amyloid fibril. I, I won't like to call it beta amyloid fibril. The reason I'm saying beta amyloid like fibrils, but I bet you on one thing, okay, that this accumulation is only because we cannot clear it. The question, does it has got sequence of those, 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 those uh, beta amyloid or other undigestible proteins? Papers are emerging enormously, okay? Uh, I know more than five or seven papers that got published in the last 13 days on this, that the sequence is omnious. It has got, uh, we cannot digest it because we don't have an enzyme for that. So, you know, new things are emerging. They are coming forward. It, it is that ALS is winning, okay? In one way, we are trying to understand the role of this protein in the pathogenesis of ALS. And I'll tell you one thing, nothing wrong with the hypothesis and and speculation, if you don't speculate, okay, you would not investigate. If you don't investigate, you will never get to the point. So my thing is that we should keep open to all schools of thought, what other scientists are thinking, what I am thinking, and I should be, and you should be very open-minded, listen to others that what they have to say, and then see that, that how we accommodate that in our own skulls, that thinks that how this disease is progressing into a neurological one. So uh, it is a bit of slow, yeah, but if we work in collaboration, okay, it's possible that we'll solve the riddle very quickly. So be it Alzheimer's, or Parkinsonism, like the thing that scares me is the acceleration. I mean, like you get developments of Alzheimer's or ALS-like thing, okay, within six months with COVID, okay, which normally you get in 15 years or 20 years, you know, and just try to imagine that, that when my patients with long haulers say that I've got cognitive issues, okay, that the whole world calls us brain fog, it's easy for me to understand because there is nothing like a brain fog. The, the brain fog is a sort of an expression of those uh, poor guys, okay, who, who can't explain what's happening to them. So this happens in Alzheimer's. This happens in advanced Parkinsonism. This happens in advanced ALS. Why is it progressing like in eight months to a disease like that? Only because we are not being able to first understand the pathogenesis, 
and we took a long time 1.5 years to at least recognize that there is a condition known as post covid syndrome you know or long covid so the the late we get here okay the more patients we will have and and the later would come the medication plus let me add one more line okay before any other uh, question comes in and before even pathogenesis are completely sorted out if you get a clue that some medication is working okay and it has produced results in other okay the, our general practitioners and physicians should be very open to allow it okay and see that how much risk is there in giving them and how much risk is in there not not giving if you don't give them okay a person would be eventually paralyzed or will lose cognitive function so if it be a herb if it be a nutraceutical if it be a even plant derivative even a repurposed drug they should actually advance it okay for its use in patients after having clinical trial data i don't see that push here i mean like uh, if if i suggest or some other scientist suggests five drugs or herbs or neuro nutraceutical why 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 the clinical trials are not there we will lose many of these patients and my heart just like bleeds for those patients okay because without clinical trials you will never come to know the effectiveness or the efficacy of those drugs so we don't have any drugs from the fda or nhs or other food, uh, regu uh, chemical regulating bodies and we are just like uh, holding hands and sitting you know just waiting that something from the sky will drop it won't we have to make the efforts and so if we within the next two months can finish off to uh, publish three or four more papers that will describe the immunodeficiency immunoparalysis and the and, uh, the big neuro covid paper and maybe yeah. one cancer development then that would form the basis for the for other scientists to look deeper and define biomarkers or diagnostic tools to and, show and what and happening on, yeah and on this front okay you know me okay like like i'm very proactive in in, in actually giving logical explanation to pathogenic mechanism that we'll do that with all whatever limited data we have got and and uh, similarly i like i was sharing it with some of my peers that in 2020 we described that it goes from the nose to the brain and and olfactory bulb which is omnius because that's actually the first step towards the causation of als nobody believed us i mean like i had to i uh, had to get gaslighted by my own peers but when they saw that coming true in in 2021 and 2022 okay they now understand so the speculations hypothesis everything with limited even amount of data i'm into it okay 24/7 let's do it but yeah the, the question more is like if you uh, if if we can get to some consensus of what yeah. is playing out what is in development then comes the next two questions or three questions even first is diagnosis diagnostics so we with our findings and with our broad understanding because we are going through tons of tons of material and mm -hmm. can we help to identify the right markers the right diagnostic markers you just said it you can't see it in an mri but can we measure ttp43 alpha synuclein or any of these so if we see and these have been measured already also in covid yeah. patients and they are elevated so if these are elevated something is going on there is no smoke without fire you know so yeah. refine that and and because the next question is uh, can it be prevented because we don't want to wait till it's manifested once it's manifested and everybody yeah. says like oh my god i got this i got that then it's going to be very very difficult to 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 cure that or uh to to stop that from yeah. really a fatal progression and you won't believe it okay that one of the most frequently asked questions on twitter uh, to me okay is that i've got a brain uh, what you call as symptomatic uh, cognitive uh, deficit okay would i recover and i i'm i'm i've just like copy pasted it somewhere okay anybody asked that i copy from there and paste it okay saying if it's a axonal uh, damage if it's a dendritic loss if it's a loss to the myelin sheath you will recover but if it's a damage to the neuron forget about it no recovery is there because i never heard a neuron getting regenerated and even you heard me on the last presentation that stem cell therapy only has got hope and you can reach that area which is sometimes at, uh, i should say most of the time unreachable so the question is that can we diagnose it in csf yes we can because you know i will pull it from the last word that you said where there is a smoke there is a fire you know 
So uh, smoke is uh, not uh, without a trace. You get uh, those those uh, fumes and the carbon out of it. It gets settled to the ground, you know. So uh, if it, there is a brain damage, okay, some neurofibrillary tangles, you know, some glial proteins, they get elevated in the CSF. And in a recent publication, okay, the biomarkers are emerging. One of them, they, they have found that if you detect this in the CSF, okay, it could give you a clue towards the, the disease. And I'll tell you something which is very anatomical, that our CSF, cerebrospinal fluid, eventually gets drained into the venous system through an area known as arachnoid villi. Okay, so just thinking that something in the CSF is like in a cage, it won't come out, it also comes in the blood. So at the time of active symptoms, if you take a blood sample, or I would say take a repeated blood samples to actually detect that biomarker, which is found in the CSF, on which we have got papers now, the diagnosis is not far away. The question is, are we going to accept it first? that CSF has got a biomarker, let's do the investigation, let's do three uh, intravenous tests, okay, in a week, so we catch the hold of, of that biomarker. It's all in the hands of the politicians and the government and, and the health section to actually promote it. They should. Yeah, but it can also be done independently by the industry themselves. You know, there are players in diagnostics, there are players in, in treatment, there are private clinics. So uh, they, they, let us, they, they let us... Have let us, emphasize, let us emphasize that on each publication we are now doing, that in the, on the bottom we give very clear indications and suggestions for further research by yeah. the medical community on what kind of biomarkers we can conclude out of the bulk of all this information that we were going through would be a yeah. decent way to start. Yeah. Uh, so because yeah. without diagnostics, nobody will start anyhow prevention or treatment. That is yeah, at, the, at, the, at the end of every manuscript, you know, I've got a habit that uh, they actually say for conclusion, okay, I insist the editor-in-chief that it should be conclusion and future direction, you know. So yes. four lines come on conclusion and then eight lines come on future direction in which we uh, tell them that how all of this paper that you have read above okay, could be taken one step forward. We, okay. we, we can do that, okay, that should be done. Yeah. Good idea. Okay, then uh, let us move on. We had all. We want to go to the thrombosis. Yeah, yeah, sure. Why not? As we have a publication underway, I don't know how much, we, how much you are at liberty <laughs> to disclose. The only thing is that uh, you already heard me that the S protein previously was thought to be having only the significance that a portion of it was sitting on ACE2 receptor. So we we actually spent it one year plus. Uh, I should say 1.5 year on only that aspect that the receptor binding domain is sitting over the AS2 receptor. And this and, this and many other papers we will show you that that same receptor binding protein is very ominous in that it has got some sequence which our body cannot digest and that in the brain can exist as beta amyloid in a thrombus can exist as amyloid fibrils or, or some unknown sequences which the body cannot digest. Here comes the point. If you cannot digest, you cannot remove it. If you cannot remove it, it will remain there. The reason of that recurrent thrombosis that you see doesn't get even improved by uh, after APHRSS or even, even plasma pharesis because it, it, you cannot clean it, okay, because the body doesn't know how to clean it. It doesn't have that enzyme. That's what the focus of this paper. Readers will uh, very hopefully and very soon get that whole PDF, okay, to I will dis discuss it with the editor-in-chief that uh, should uh, keep it an open access, maybe... Uh, to keep it in over, uh, open access, we will have to pay them something, okay? And we will keep it open access because we want everything to be openly accessed, okay? So that everybody reads and understands what's going wrong in their body. So it will very soon come to, uh, to, to the audience here. I'm very hopeful. There is, of course, another... Uh, I just got a paper last night uh, showing that in the long COVID patients, up to one year now, or even more than one year, a significant amount of spike proteins are still circulating within the blood. And if that comes together with inflammation, neutrophil activation, and uh, recruitment and netosis, and subsequent elastasin as a catalyst, then of course these clots will will keep forming. And yeah, yeah. We, in the discussion about solutions, you, I also want to ask you some other things on. on uh, disaggregation of these fibers and what you think about yeah some other things
move on to to your presentation and uh, our listeners are waiting for solutions because we always bring so many challenges and problems and we share this problem so people need solutions i will share the screen now okay so yeah please excuse the military language strategic and tactical responses because i think that we are in a kind of a war and so the first priority should be do not get infected yeah, because uh, we think that Omicron does hold some surprises and any other variant that's going to come might even be a little bit more detrimental than the one we are looking at now. So that would be the first thing. Isolate yourself. So to protest against measures to distance people from indoor events um, is something that's a two-edged sword. I mean... Uh, um, our civil liberties are one thing, but the other thing is also, of course, to protect ourselves and loved ones and other people from getting infected. So do that as good as possible um, and to stay away from any indoor exposures, especially like in public transportation, in, in, uh, in uh, elevators or uh, offices, people have to go to work. So the next question is, if I have to go outside and be exposed to people, especially as a long hauler with that kind of risk, uh, what else can I do? So this is not medical advice, but it is uh, something that we have seen uh, works and that was also proven in settings of uh, healthcare workers where uh, these kind of nasal sprays, for example, came in uh, quite handy as protection. Yeah, they are not 100% protection, but um, using them after being exposed and maybe not so much uh, as a protection to get infected, but if, if you are if you were exposed and you still have some virus in your nose, so iodine spray or algovir spray, for example, can be a good idea. I use that myself personally, and I'm very lucky I haven't had COVID at all yet in this time. And then the next thing, of course, if our immune system is already a little bit impaired, or even in general, it would be good to have a strong antiviral at hand, especially if you're a long hauler. So there is another task force at the moment that has been formed within the Long COVID Coalition by medical experts. And uh, so I'm helping in that to see um, what, what can be good solutions of trying to reset the immune system to help the T lymphocytes and the monocytes and the natural killer cells to be um, regenerated. And so that our immune systems are being brought back to some strengths because the most important is, of course, to have a strong innate and adaptive immune system. So that is another ongoing project of which we will keep everybody informed. Here you see some uh, interesting masks. Um, I'm using myself a different one, but I like this one. I don't know if it's on the market yet, but everybody in his country can, can start a search. There are masks with an antiviral coating that will uh, uh, like neutralize bacteria and viruses. So because the mask normally... Is just like protecting you from shedding virus. That is, in my opinion, the biggest uh, achievement that masks can do. But the masks are too, um, the, the, the filters are not tight enough to, to, to uh, filter out virus. So you need some kind of coating on the mask to help to neutralize the virus that are getting stuck on the mask, at least. And so I think that is a, a, a real good measure, um, a countermeasure. And then, of course, there is the what I've been practicing now with my family and everybody around us on a daily basis as much as possible is to do to get good um, updated antigen tests and make sure that you're not uh, carrying or that you're not infective before you leave the house. If that would be done widespread, uh, you can do it even as a pool test. There are saliva tests that you can do with several persons so that it's not so expensive. But just make sure that everybody that leaves the house is not uh, not uh, showing symptoms or shedding virus. So that would be another really, really good uh, strategical measure actually for the whole population. Uh, I think testing is one of the best uh, uh, ways to, to prevent uh, you from infecting other people. Yeah, and then we have, uh, of course, developed ourselves as a company, as a distance. So I do have a conflict of interest here which I don't see as a conflict of interest because the product is actually really good and it really works. And then, so I'm not uh, promoting anything that I am not 100% endorsing myself with all my work and all my time and all my financial resources. So if we go to the next slide, you can see there 
some uh, protocols that work on uh, acute COVID as well as on long COVID and help to um, help the organism to uh, to fight these um, these conditions. Uh, we even included a, a product you might call our competitor, which I consider. I've been talking to them today again, which I consider as a good additional uh, weapon, especially as it is uh, having another uh, another technology, the micelle technology, and it works through the mucus layer and goes into the um, in, in directly into the bloodstream. And we see that it contains some uh, other ingredients as we have in our current protocol and that might come in handy especially in um, helping to prevent the neurological severe neurological issues um, and you see then on the right side next to the medicinals um, product you see some other recommendations these are companies that we have no affiliation with and, and none of the other products shown here we have any financial interest or any kind of uh, agreement for um, percentages for sale. It is just like what has been shown by other groups, by other experts, by other medical experts, experts, and what has been uh, in the literature now to be um, beneficial in order to have complementary um, activities uh, um, on, on top of additional nine, for example. So if we go on, the, on to the next slide, I can show you some examples of what these nutraceuticals that everybody is kind of um, not taking serious can do. Here's an animal trial that we did, and it was a myocardial infarction that we induced artificially uh, with isoprotein and all uh, in rats. And you can see the left um, picture is a biopsy of the heart tissue after the animal trial, some animals were sacrificed. And on the right side, you see the biopsy of an animal that was treated with medicinals, and you can see a clear um, difference in the, um, in the damage that has been done to the myocardial tissue. So. Uh, as myocarditis and pericarditis are very common, um, it might be a good idea to have something preventive at hand that can, uh, while the myocarditis and pericarditis are ongoing, that you don't run, uh, run into uh, damage to your heart muscle. Because very similar to your neurons, uh, once the damage is done, it's very difficult to, to, uh, to uh, um, treat that. Then we go to the next slide where we do have some interesting results in the current Omicron wave, we, we did have some users of our product. And here you can see one, one patient report. He was uh, on 23rd of June, he was uh, tested positive with a PCR and a CT value of 16. And four days later, you can see it was negative. So that is a very interesting result to see that with the new variants, the average um, elevation of CT value, which is showing the viral load, is at 4.75 per day. That is really a very, very good result of, uh, of clearing the virus. So all our efforts um, in all the groups that we are working with, which are uh, many fold different working groups, is aiming at getting us out of this situation and to lock up this virus and hopefully get on with our lives very soon and protect people from long-term damage. Yeah, that is all from my side. Dr. Martin, do you have any more, any else, anything else to add? Yeah, I, I think that uh, uh, you presented uh, the stuff very comprehensively. The only thing is that uh, I would like to say that whenever some uh, disease strikes us and we don't have a remedy for it, okay, uh, sooner, and we see that uh, it's taking long for the agencies and our healthcare authorities and the politicians to understand the situation, whatever comes as a good stuff, okay, from people, okay, who are, who are actually having that uh, product and uh, they are reporting some good effects, you know, you always uh, could consult your doctor, your GP, your local physician, let's see, I've got six reviews, or seven reviews of uh, patients saying that they improved in this aspect or this aspect of, of their symptoms. Can I have it? How much should I have it? And if I have it, okay, what, what medications that I'm having, I will have to hold back. This all should be done. And in the face of when you have got nothing else to that you see working, okay, any product, okay, which is safe, which has undergone trial previously for any other 
infections or any other conditions in which it has shown effects my suggestion is that talk to your gp talk to your doctor reinforce that you have got people with reviews okay who actually have shown good effects with them and 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 then uh, 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 just see that how it works in you and uh, when it comes to uh, specific therapies against sars cov 2 development of a particular drug is going to take time that's okay i understand that i mean like uh, we 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 actually go for trials see the result and then actually approve the drug but then several drugs have achieved emergency use authorization we call it eua why can't uh, our products okay which are uh, coming up with good results can be actually submitted for the eu a permission from local governments okay or, or particular governments where you live try to do that and be safe like you heard from joshim you need not to be exposed again and again because you know if your glass gets filled quicker okay you lose the lymphocyte okay and then uh, the quality of your life is 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 going to go down so please be careful okay from my side i wish all of you best of luck and best of your endeavors that you are trying with i understand that you you suffer a lot okay but then don't think that if we don't have the disease on the other side of the board we are just sitting and and we are sleeping at peace no we are working day and night for you and then we will come up with something okay so don't lose the hope keep the faith okay thank you very much thank you thank you everyone for joining this discussion as always only top information only up to date scientific knowledge is discussed on our channel and uh, please take this information go to your practitioners help us share uh, among wider communities uh, like this video share it among your friends we will be heard sooner and quicker uh, and maybe solutions will come quicker uh, to your homes so thank you very much and let's stay healthy and together good night thank you thank you everybody okay.